The passage through the history of boxing of Mike Tyson is written in golden letters of indelible ink manufactured with the blood, sweat, and tears of all those who ever tried to defeat him in the boxing ring. Some more arrogant than others, Iron Mike boasts a long list of opponents left sprawled on the canvases of the most iconic rings worldwide over decades. In today's video, I bring you a countdown filled with explosive jabs, soul-piercing direct hooks, and sadistic combinations of punches that earned the youngest heavyweight champion in history not only the title of the one to beat just by seeing him approach. It's set. It's set I hope you're comfortable because the level of aggression and violence you're about to witness will captivate you until the end of the video and won't let go until the safety count is over. Ready for a new journey through time? Let's do it! Mike Tyson vs. Donnie Long it was October 9, 85, when Mike Tyson and Donnie Long answered the cold call of destiny to face off in the ring at the Trump Casino Hotel in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Accompanying them was the legendary Frank Cappuccino, present in so many relevant contests, joining what was expected to be Tyson's first fight against a legitimately powerful opponent. Mike's professional record remained clean with eight victories by knockout, while Donnie seemed to struggle to maintain his status as a contender with 15 wins, 10 of them by knockout and three losses. After three, Tyson, already angered by Long's audacity to rise again, unleashed a barrage that made him kneel a minute with couldn't accept the no to victory only to receive a short left hook that bent his knees and sent him test, but even without starting the safety count, Frank Cappuccino knew that Long was no longer a match for Tyson and decided to stop the fight before exposing him to much more severe damage. After this brutal knockout, one minute and 28 seconds into the first round, Mike sent only a lethal kiss to the camera. Mike Tyson vs. Mitch, Mitch Green. Green May 20, 86 For many, just another day. For boxing history enthusiasts, the great night when Mike Tyson and Mitch Green faced off at Madison Square Garden in New York. In addition to their participation, George Cologne, George DeGabriel, and Pat Dolan would play an important role in the bout, acting as judges. Their critical eyes had to point out a clear winner in case the fighters' fists didn't do it by the end of the scheduled 10 rounds. With Mike Tyson a beast with a clean record of 20 victories, 19 by knockout, and Mitch Green, who had 16 wins, 10 by knockout, 1 loss, and 1 draw, a true clash of titans was anticipated. After the bell signaling the start of the battle, Tyson focused on pressuring Green at all times. Three times he managed to make Green's mouthpiece fly, and in as many occasions he left him in a state of shock with short and devastating blows to the head and body. Keep that jab in his face and not be for 10 rounds. I had the same experience when I fought my, uh, your opposition, uh, knowing that he's capable. Good left hand by lead him back. Watch the left hook of Mike Tyson. However, Green showed what he was made of by not falling to the power of the Iron Mike legend and defending himself with tough flurries every time Tyson opened his guard. Every time Mitch Green moves backwards, you notice that there is no mouthpiece in Mitch Green's mouth. He was knocked out by left hook. There is no doubt that the crowd of over 6,500 people experienced many moments of excitement, although during the last rounds, they showed their displeasure with chorus of boos. Tyson never put Green in danger except once during the early episodes when it seemed he would go down from two body shots. After 10 thrilling and exhausting rounds, Mike Tyson defeated Mitch Green by unanimous decision of the judges. Another day in the classroom, big left hand to end things. His 21st straight win and his many fights, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson versus Frank Bruno. In 89, specifically on February 25th, Mike Tyson and Frank Bruno made history by facing each other at the Las Vegas Hilton, Hilton Center, in Nevada. It was Tyson's first defense of the Ring Magazine's World Heavyweight title, the fifth defense of the International Boxing Federation World Heavyweight title, the seventh defense of the World Boxing Association World Heavyweight title, and the eighth defense of the World Boxing Council World Heavyweight title. There was an announced crowd of 9,860 people and the average ticket price had been $700. It was Tyson's first fight in eight months and before this he had never been away from the ring for such a long time. Everyone was eager. Iron Mike initiated the contest on a good note. In his corner, he delivered a short right to Bruno's jaw with enough force to knock him down. Bruno down after a right hand. 
Referee Richard Steele counted to eight to allow Bruno to get up with a clear head. Bruno began to play dirty when he landed a punch on Tyson's nape, resulting in a point deduction on the judge's scorecard. Solid left and a right by Tyson, and now Bruno rabbit punches Mike. But by the end of the round, he would recover. He used his skillful right fist to hit Tyson with enough power to immobilize him for a moment, followed by a left hook that caught him squarely. The knees of the champion, who until that moment seemed unbreakable, bent and he had no choice but to step back. Like any good warrior, Tyson knew how to rise from the ashes and defeat Bruno by technical knockout two minutes and 55 seconds into the fifth round. Trying to land the one haymaker. Oh, he's, it's just a metal it's here. Vicious that's that's not, shot. That's not, that, that, that photo shot. And Beautiful Richard shot. Steele has seen enough. Still, after the fight, he praised the powerful punch that Bruno gave him, stating that it was harder than the punch Tony Tucker gave him. Mike Tyson vs. Peter McNeely Breaking his own record of returning to fight after a long hiatus, we reach August 19, 95. The date when Mike Tyson stood under the spotlight again to face Peter McNeely at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada. The venue was fortunate to host a fight described as an overwhelming financial success. How could it not be? It was Tyson's first fight in four years due to his prison sentence. It was a highly anticipated bout that set a new record for pay-per-view sales. The fight lasted only 89 seconds, which were enough for Mike to wreak havoc in the ring. McNeely started the fight aggressively, thinking Tyson would be out of shape due to his time behind bars. Mike managed to avoid the wild punches of an opponent who couldn't even grasp the magnitude of the danger he faced and landed a right hook that left him on the canvas in less than 10 seconds into the bout. As advertised, comes right at Mike Tyson. Goes Second. After taking the count of eight from Mills Lane, the referee, McNeely got up to continue attacking Tyson aggressively. Both were exchanging blows in a corner by the first minute of the round. Less than 20 seconds later, Tyson landed a right hook loaded with enough force to drop McNeely for the second time. Mills Lane had stopped that nonsense because it was starting to butt heads. Oh, Tyson with a left hook and right up the back. It was then that Vinny Vecchioni, McNeely's manager, jumped into the ring to prevent his fighter from suffering more damage. This simple but cowardly act was enough for Mills Lane to stop the fight and declare Tyson the winner by disqualification. Mike Tyson vs. James Smith Back in 87, if we look at the calendar, precisely on March 7th, at the Las Vegas Hilton Outdoor Arena in Nevada, the event Mike Tyson vs. James Bonecrusher Smith took place. A fight that was recorded in history despite its controversial outcome. Unlike the previous opponent, James and his team decided not to flee like rats at the first sign of danger. In what would be Tyson's first defense of the World Boxing Council heavyweight title and Smith's first defense of the World Boxing Association heavyweight title, both fighters were more than willing to go the distance of the scheduled 12 rounds. Tyson's clean record of 28 victories, 26 of them by knockout, made him the clear favorite against Smith, with 19 wins, 14 by knockout, and 5 losses. Perhaps the fight lasted so long because, instead of bombarding, Smith resisted to the point of receiving two point deductions from Mills Lane, the referee, for his blatant attempts to cling to Mike's body. Tyson felt so frustrated during the fight due to his opponent's defensive tactics that he decided to engage in several shoving matches between rounds, hoping to provoke enough fury in Smith to initiate a good exchange of blows. But the intensity Tyson emanated was rarely reciprocal, making the fight last until the end of the 12 rounds with a predator trying to hunt down prey playing it safe. In the end, Dalby Shirley scored 119 to 107, Jose Juan Guerra scored 119 to 107, and Lou Tabbitt scored 120 to 106, all in favor of Tyson. Thus, he was proclaimed the winner by unanimous decision of the judges in a fight that could have given more but recorded its passage through the history of the discipline as a title unification. Mike Tyson vs. Tony Tucker 
continuing the line of fighters who managed to finish a fight against Iron Mike Standing but not without enduring hellish punishments inflicted by the fists of the young knockout machine, we arrive at August 1, 1987. In the ring at the Las Vegas Hilton, Hilton Center, in Nevada, another title unification fight took place, this time between Mike Tyson and Tony Tucker. With Mills Lane as the referee, it was Tucker's first defense of the International Boxing Federation Heavyweight World title, Tyson's second defense of the World Boxing Association Heavyweight World title, as well as his third defense of the World Boxing Council Heavyweight World title. It was the final fight of HBO's heavyweight unification tournament, keeping thousands of fans around the world on edge as it was a clash between two undefeated fighters. Tyson's clean record stood at 30 victories, with 27 of them by knockout, while Tucker's record surpassed it with 34 victories, 29 of them by knockout. It was something completely unusual, and it seemed that finally a fighter had arrived who would give the invincible Iron Mike his first defeat. During the fight, Tyson had trouble landing more than one punch because Tucker fought very well, engaging in a battle of survival. Tucker's aggressive fighting style allowed him to shake Tyson's head with powerful right-hand punches during the early rounds. Technically speaking, no one gave Tucker, and we always felt that he was susceptible to take jazz. But... Another right hand. However, after the fourth round, the promising opponent started losing steam, and that's when he shifted to survival mode to reach the 12 scheduled rounds. Tucker kept his distance, moved around the ring, dodged Tyson's explosive charges, and occasionally managed to neutralize the attacks of a beast that no one had tamed before. It wasn't until the last two-thirds of the fight that Tyson landed significant blows, although Tucker showed he hadn't perished on the battlefield by delivering a powerful left hook to Tyson's head during the final round. Sometimes work. Great fight. After a long battle, the three judges voted for Tyson. Phil Newman scored at 119 to 111, Julio Roldan marked 118 to 113, and Bill Graham added 116 to 112. After the fight, sports press experts claimed there were no knockdowns precisely because Tony Tucker had the intelligence to change his fighting style, adopting tactics that had frustrated Iron Mike in previous bouts. Mike Tyson vs. Tony Tubbs A Tony who didn't know how to adapt to Tyson's aggressive fighting style and succumb to him in the ring was Tony Tubbs. On March 21, 1988, Tubbs faced Tyson at the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan, in about scheduled to last 12 rounds but had an extremely premature ending. It was Tyson's third defense of the International Boxing Federation heavyweight title, the fifth defense of the World Boxing Association heavyweight title, and the sixth defense of the World Boxing Council heavyweight title. With a professional record of 33 victories, achieving 29 of them by knockouts, Tyson still positioned himself as the overwhelming favorite against Tubbs with 25 victories, 16 by knockouts, and one loss. Historical fact this was the second heavyweight world title fight in Japan, the first took place on September 1, 1973, where George Foreman defeated Jose Roman by knockout in the first round. During the first round, Tubbs had the opportunity to exchange punches with Tyson, mitigating the champion's attacks with jabs and quick combinations. When he lost to Witherspoon, the only defeat. However, he maintained a lax posture, rarely moving while fighting. The second round had a slow start like the first, but it would explode once Tyson began exerting more pressure on a stiff Tubbs who, unknowingly, was close to breaking. So it's going to be the stalking routine, as always, with Mike Tyson. But success with the jab, a very, very smart jab, he's pulling it. The challenger's punches lacked the power to stop the champion, and Tyson saw the perfect opportunity to attack Tubbs' substantial body. Yeah, watch him bringing that area, bringing the uppercut there. I was a big fan of Tubbs when he was an amateur. He was this again and again, he landed hooks to the stomach. But pretty accurate. Destroyer has got to work on this fellow all the time because it may not be one punch that would do it. As the round approached its end, the effect of all these punches began to show. Tyson trapped Tubbs against the ropes, sinking him with a succession of direct hooks to his abdomen. 
Trying to stay in the fight, executing a weak combination of punches in the midst of the exchange, Tubbs opened his guard and was completely exposed to Iron Mike's fury. Tubbs was caught by a left hook that struck his right eye, making him stagger in his feeble attempts to walk. After a couple of turns, he ended up falling backward motionless to the canvas. Arthur Mercant conducted the safety count, but it was clear from Tubbs' cut bleeding onto the canvas that he had nothing more to offer. Mike was declared the winner by technical knockout at 2 minutes and 54 seconds of the second round. Mike Tyson vs. Lennox Lewis With the arrival of the new millennium, the possibility arose again that Iron Mike might not be as lethal as he was in the 80s or 90s. Intent on silencing all his detractors on June 8, 2002 in the ring at the Pyramid in Memphis, Tennessee. Tyson had the courage to try to prove that he still harbored the power that made him the youngest heavyweight champion in history in his capable fists. Now the challenger, as the fight would be Lewis's first defense of the World Boxing Council, International Boxing Federation, and the Ring Magazine's heavyweight world titles. The confrontation began long before entering the ring when, during the January 22nd press conference of the same year, a brawl broke out between both fighters, their teams, and authorities, ending with the president of the World Boxing Council, Jose Suleiman, unconscious. It was a strange scenario where Lewis was the betting favorite 2-1, to one, but this only motivated the beast within Mike to prove that he could be champion once again. Once in the ring, the only audience bothered was those who trusted in Tyson's abilities to silence all those who blasphemed his name. In general terms, the fight can be defined as domination as Lewis served as Tyson's executioner that night at the pyramid. Tyson suffered cuts to both eyes, while Lewis's heart attacks to his face turned his nose into a source of blood. The long-awaited fight, which had been brewing for years, turned out to be a complete mismatch when it ended in the middle of the eighth round. Tyson had been caught by a series of powerful hooks, so strong that they made him fall to the canvas after suffering a crushing right to the chin. There were only 35 seconds left in the round, but Tyson had little intention of returning to the fight. With the referee Eddie Cotton's count, Lewis's victory by knockout became official. Mike Tyson vs. Tyrell Biggs You didn't think I'd end this compilation with a decisive defeat for Iron Mike. Let's relive what possibly wasn't his best or fastest knockout but was the most satisfying of his professional career. On October 16, 1987, Tyson sought revenge against Tyrell Biggs by destroying him in the ring at the convention hall in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Tyson and Biggs had known each other for years when young Mike kept the dream alive of representing his country in the Olympics. Due to his height, the Olympic team didn't believe in the skills of the young knockout machine to bring the gold medal home, making Biggs the chosen one. The rivalry between the two fighters began after, at the airport, in front of the media, civilians, and the rest of the team, Biggs humiliated Tyson by mocking the fact that he wouldn't be one of the Olympic fighters in the edition. So, patiently, Tyson trained to become the beast that would prove not only that he had everything and more to represent his country, but also to beat an Olympic medalist of Tyrell Biggs' caliber. Returning to the contest, both entered the ring undefeated. Tyson's record was 31 victories, 27 of them by knockout, and Biggs's record stood at 15 victories, achieving 10 of them by knockouts. It was Tyson's first defense of the International Boxing Federation heavyweight title, the third defense of the World Boxing Association heavyweight title, and the fourth defense of the World Boxing Council heavyweight title. Tyson not only felt that Biggs's medal should have been his, now there was a real risk that the same man could steal the titles for which he had worked so hard after being denied the opportunity of his life. Of course, he was going to turn the ring into a hunting ground. After the start bell, almost immediately, Tyson's hard fists began landing one after another on Biggs's jaw. Uh, Tyrell Biggs, the lateral movement. Those hands should be up a little higher because, again, the hands... 
The champion's left hooks seem to rain on the challenger from all directions. Before the punch actually is thrown. Well, whatever he does, the fact that... And Tyson threw them as if he were in a batting practice, according to the praises of the sports press of the time. For six rounds, Biggs, the 1984 super heavyweight Olympic champion, had no choice but to absorb the hard bombs that Mike let hit him. Uh, but he really bothered There me. is the hook, again, because his hands are down. Mistake. That's something you pointed out before the fight. This is a good education for the public because the fans at home, because they're seeing... By the seventh episode, the inevitable arrived, Biggs had had enough. The long-awaited victory came for Tyson at 2 minutes and 59 seconds when a left hook sent Biggs flying to his corner, where his body hit the canvas with his feet in the air. And he's never, there's a right hand that just caught Biggs off balance. But he Rolling didn't put him away. The hell was it. He is gone right now. He has no And 10 seconds to go in around. There's a left hand. He's down again. It's a Tyson not only achieved his 32nd professional victory that night, but also his personal revenge in what could be the most significant fight of his life. Opening the 90s with great force, Mike Tyson and Donovan Ruddock were not just the protagonists of a fight, but of a war that would unfold in two battles in the ring and a parallel one to determine who was the number one contender in the discipline. Highlighting the best and worst moments of each, our invitation is for you to stay until the end of the video and join us on this journey filled with deadly left hooks, controversial low blows, and much excitement even after the bell signaling the end of the contest. The extensive battle between Mike Tyson and Donovan Ruddock would begin on March 18, 1991, with the Mirage Hotel and Casino Ring in Las Vegas as the battlefield. The fight would be supervised by the critical eyes of judges Jerry Roth, Chuck Jampa, and Dave Moretti, and controlled by the wisdom of referee Richard Steele. Tyson would enter the scene as the number one heavyweight contender in the World Boxing Council, World Boxing Association, and International Boxing Federation. There was great anticipation for the fight simply because Donovan Ruddock was the next in line. Ruddock's professional record at 27 years old was 25 victories, 18 by knockout, one defeat, and zero draws. Tyson, at only 24, had 39 victories, 35 by knockout, and one defeat. As the bell rang, the first round began, and Tyson leaped from his corner with the characteristic aggressive fighting style that made him nearly unstoppable at that time. With his body already absorbing powerful combinations of punches, Ruddock sought to land effective counterattacks without neglecting his guard to neutralize Iron Mike's severe offensive. Throw a big punch, he stumbled after the punch. It's done something, it's stopped Iron Mike. An associate minister lets them know, doesn't seem to care. A hard body punch by Tyson. That Ruddock would go down early in the second round after receiving a powerful left hook that temporarily weakened his legs. Defended by Ruddock. Despite surpassing the safety count, he demonstrated that he had much more to offer before being declared defeated. It didn't get to a warning, but that's the kind of stuff that's going to get cost him if the fight continues. Still will happen. Showing that the previous round was no fluke, Tyson would knock down Ruddock once again during the third round. After engaging in close combat with his rival for most of the episode, with less than 10 seconds remaining, another powerful left hook would send Ruddock to the canvas. The audience couldn't believe what was happening, and it was evident on Ruddock's face that he, too, didn't fully comprehend the situation. Showing readiness to continue at the count of eight, the bell allowed him to return to his corner and rethink his strategy before Tyson proved that the third time is the charm. Despite staying on his feet, the fourth and fifth rounds wouldn't necessarily be Ruddock's resurgence. Tyson, seemingly punishing him mercilessly like a medieval executioner, applied enough pressure for his opponent to break at any moment. He's got to get his fire going again. Steel, one, oh. Tyson's promoter, Don King. Oh, so or is honest. A flurry in the center. Despite actively seeking to inflict some damage with his counterattacks, Ruddock had trouble landing a significant blow on Iron Mike's body, who appeared to be very close to achieving his goal, victory. Tyson opened the sixth round by pushing Ruddock back against the ropes, a move that would be repeated more than once within the time limit marked by the bell. 
Throwing punches with decreasing certainty, Ruddock began to resemble a punching bag for a fighter who didn't mind breaking his soul with punches, if necessary, to secure a knockout victory. Who continues to stay on his feet. He's been knocked out twice. Combination by Mike. Ending his ordeal in the seventh round, Tyson finally positioned Ruddock against the ropes to deliver the most deadly combination of punches he had received in his entire professional career. After moving toward the center of the ring, it seemed that Iron Mike's attacks had ceased until a second flurry of punches made Donovan Ruddock dance like a puppet colliding with the ropes, at which point Richard Steele knew he had given his all and was not in a condition to continue. Mike Tyson defeated Donovan Ruddock by technical knockout at 2 minutes and 22 seconds of the seventh round. Far from being the end of the war, it would be only one of the two battles that both fighters would engage in to determine who was the ultimate champion. In parallel, while the fighters shared a friendly embrace, their corners decided to start their own battle, creating a true chaos in the boxing ring. Having to separate the contenders, fearing they might get involved in the riot, one of the most unsportsmanlike scenarios in the history of the sport unfolded. Far from accepting defeat by the great Mike Tyson, Ruddock would do everything possible to have a second chance, leading them back to where it all began, the ring at the Mirage Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas on June 28, 1991. Chuck Champa would also be reprising his role as a judge, joined by Dalby Shirley and Art Lurie. This time, it would be referee Mills Lane's task to ensure the fight took place as cleanly as possible. Adding a victory to the previously mentioned record, Tyson once again presented himself as the number one contender in the World Boxing Council, World Boxing Association, and International Boxing Federation. Ruddock, who would add a loss to his record, remained the next in line. However, he maintained hope that this time he would succeed in overcoming Iron Mike. After the bell rang, the first round of one of the most anticipated rematches for the general public began. From the very beginning, Tyson adopted his explosive fighting style, making it clear to Ruddock that he had to approach him with a different offensive if he didn't want to achieve the same result. As if it were deja vu, Ruddock would go down in the second round after receiving a powerful right hook. Getting up immediately, he only allowed Iron Mike, who seemed out of control, to continue punishing him without showing any mercy. Ruddock would taste the canvas once again during the fourth round. It was a bold left hook that made him fall backward, rising at the count of eight to demonstrate his ability to continue the fight. From this point on, the fight stabilized, with occasional attacks from Ruddock trying to cause enough damage to slow down or deteriorate the cruel offensive Tyson maintained in each completed round. Closing the eighth episode, Mills Lane deducted a point from Ruddock after, knowingly, he hit Tyson after the bell rang. His chances of winning the fight were becoming slim, and his decision to disrespect the time limits only demonstrated the helplessness he felt in being dominated a second time by the Iron Mike Beast. Again, action after the bell. Both these guys Tyson, not being the cleanest fighter in the contest, also suffered a point deduction imposed by Lane after, during the ninth and 10th rounds, he allowed controversial low blows to land on his opponent. With both pugilists giving their best, this time, the level of forces remained sufficiently balanced to allow them to reach the end of the originally agreed upon 12 rounds. After the bell signaling the end of the contest, the decision of who would be awarded the victory would depend on each judge's perspective regarding who set the pace of the fight and who submitted to it. When the announcer took center ring, the moods were truly heated. Leaving just enough intrigue to generate more excitement, he soon announced that the result was a unanimous decision in favor of Mike Tyson. 
Like two gentlemen, both fighters shook hands, shared a hug, and exchanged a few words, putting an end to a rivalry that extended for months, even though Donovan Rudda couldn't remove the thorn of joining the few who defeated the Great Iron Mike. Two battles with similar outcomes but different endings, demonstrating the art of knowing how to lose beyond knowing how to win. If you've made it this far, we can only thank you for joining us in reliving two of the most significant encounters in the journey of Mike Tyson and Donovan Ruddock in the discipline. Getting into the ring against Mike Tyson, even in the early stages of his professional career, was quite a challenge. Many people today consider those boxers who even thought about facing such a formidable opponent as masochists. In today's video, we'll share a top list that will take you from his early fights to the establishment of his legend, and fights that not only left his opponents in a state of shock, but also amazed the entire world. In 1985, a young Tyson shocked the world in his second professional fight, ending Trent Singleton's career in less than a minute. A right hook made Singleton fall forward, and he was on all fours within just 15 seconds of the fight's start. One. Well, we didn't get much of a chance to see Tyson. What so his reaction was to get up almost immediately, only to be knocked against the ropes by a left hook, ultimately falling on his back at 33 seconds into the first round. He got back on his feet at the count of three, but Tyson advanced and launched a barrage that made Singleton stumble forward, causing both of his gloves to touch the canvas, leading the referee to end the fight. Young Tyson not only defeated Trent Singleton, who was fighting at the lightest weight of his professional career, but also turned the match into his fourth knockout defeat in the last of Singleton's career. Tyson's eighth professional fight, also in 1985, became a memorable moment. Johnson entered the ring that night with a record of two wins and four losses in his six previous fights, with each loss coming by knockout. Tyson, on the other hand, had an impeccable streak of seven knockout victories. Tyson sent Johnson to the canvas with a left hook just 23 seconds into the fight. I'm glad you pointed it out because down here... Johnson managed to get up at the count of three, but Iron Mike quickly launched a powerful right that connected with Michael's jaw, leaving Johnson on the canvas once again. Canvas. 23 pound weight oh, advantage and he put it all right, there the right to the even before starting the count the referee signaled the end of the fight johnson remained in the ring for a few moments before receiving assistance and being seated on a stool to recover from the shock of tyson's punches 1985 continued to be a successful year for tyson's professional career in his first fight without Cus D'Amato, who had passed away nine days earlier due to pneumonia, Iron Mike made history once again. The first punch Richardson received in his fight with Tyson was a right cross that sent him to the canvas just eight seconds into the fight. However, he managed to get up at the count of seven and tried to evade Tyson's fury. At one minute and five seconds of the first round, a left hand blocked Richardson's knees, sending him to the canvas again, this time staying down. Tyson's humility was evident when, once the safety count for Richardson was over, he helped him to his feet, along with the referee. When asked if he had ever been hit so hard before, Richardson's response surprised the media, stating, yes, about a year ago, I got hit by a truck. December 1985, and Tyson knew he had to close his professional year on a high note. The Felt Forum in New York would be the first venue where Tyson would be seen wearing what would become his characteristic attire, solid black trunks. Scaff entered the ring having lost his two previous fights against Proud Kilimanjaro and Tim Witherspoon, trying to make the third times the charm saying come true. 17 seconds into the fight, Tyson threw a left hook that put Scaff against the ropes, causing significant bleeding as his nose was shattered. He's got yeah, sure early. Sure did. He's a right hand. He's... Tyson, without fear of blood, continued with a solid right hook to Scaff's jaw, making him retreat and occasionally throw wild hooks. It was a short left hook that put Scaff against the ropes and on his chest at one minute and four seconds of that fateful first round. Tyson does not throw wild punches. Big left hook. 
Scaff struggled to get up at the count of eight, but the referee indicated that the fight was over. This encounter became Scaff's sixth knockout defeat in his professional career and Tyson's 14th consecutive knockout victory. Moving on to July 26, 1986, Tyson had his second knockout victory over Frazier. Tyson's record positioned him as the man to beat, with 24 wins, 22 of them by knockout. In contrast, Frazier had 16 wins, with only 7 of them by knockout, and he had been defeated previously by Larry Holmes in the first round. Just 30 seconds into the fight, Tyson used a right hook to knock out Frazier in the first of the scheduled 10 rounds. Frazier was surprised by a quick right hand from Tyson after the bell rang to start the fight. This forced Frazier to retreat and eventually be cornered, where he received the hook that left him lying on the canvas. The referee, Joe Cortez, counted to five before indicating the end of the fight. Moving a bit closer to the present, on September 6, 1986, in Las Vegas, Mike Tyson, still undefeated after 26 professional fights, faced Alfonso Ratliff in his first fight against a former world champion. Ratliff had a record of 21 wins, with 16 by knockout, and 3 losses. Ratliff managed to escape Tyson's pursuit during the first round, only to encounter a fierce left hook that knocked him down early in the second round. Well, he's one of the few guys that was able to uh, test the chin of Mike Tyson in exchange for... And Ratliff continues on the bike. And there was a left hand. Tyson saw Ratliff get up at the count of nine, so he launched rapid barges of punches as he pursued him along the ropes. Ratliff didn't last long and was once again shaken by a powerful right hook, setting up a series of punches Tyson had planned, leading to that devastating left hook that put Ratliff on the canvas again. On all fours, Ratliff could hear the referee, Devell Pearl, stop the fight without even beginning the safety count. On May 30th, 1987, Pink Lawn Thomas would only resist until the sixth round of his 12-round fight with Mike Tyson. Tyson retained his heavyweight title, awarded by the World Boxing Council and the World Boxing Association, when he knocked out Thomas two minutes into the sixth round. Surprisingly, during the first round, the entire Hilton Outdoor Stadium in Las Vegas witnessed Thomas effectively neutralize Tyson with well-thought-out tactics, making Iron Mike retreat and stay out of reach. Well, Thomas is all right. You know why Tyson's able to nail some guys because he does and one of those punches is going to land. But that's one of the keys is punch for uh, pick the Thomas to the jab. The jab breaks the rhythm. Another big left hand. Thomas is hurt. Tyson managed to hold on until the sixth round when he hurt Thomas with a right to the body, followed by a quick right hook to the chin. This led to one of Tyson's favorite punch combinations from that point on, culminating in a left hook to Pinkland's head that left him in serious trouble. Thomas had no choice but to retreat, with Tyson now relentlessly pursuing him with combinations of left and right punches until he was lying on the canvas with glassy eyes. Carlos Padilla, the referee, leaned in toward Thomas to begin the safety count, but when he reached nine, he was interrupted by Angelo Dundee, Pinkland's trainer, who asked him to stop the fight. Thus, in a somewhat controversial manner, the referee had no choice but to end the fight, giving Tyson a technical knockout victory. We arrive at the end of our video with a match that took place on January 22, 1988, 
when the Atlantic City Convention Center in New Jersey witnessed the clash between Mike Tyson and Larry Holmes. Tyson was the favorite in the betting odds at 8-1, to one, at only 21 years old, 17 years younger than Holmes, at 38. He delivered an exemplary boxing performance as the clear aggressor throughout the match. However, it wasn't until the fourth round that he managed to reach Holmes, who was on the brink of retirement. Holmes got into serious trouble after taking a powerful right from Tyson that landed squarely on his chin, prompting him to fall into Mike's corner. Right now, getting through this fourth round is the biggest problem. Oh, right hand! Down goes Mike! At the count of four, Holmes got up, and while the referee, Cortez, gave the mandatory eight count, Larry tried to clear his thoughts by shaking his head a couple of times, but Tyson was already on the attack. The violent punches Tyson was throwing occasionally made Holmes head snap back. The ringside attendants began to shout for the fight to be stopped, but Holmes could only escape from Tyson's relentless pursuit. Holmes abruptly halted his retreat after taking a strong right hook from Tyson, and as soon as he fell on his back to the canvas, Cortez finally signaled the end of the fight. The power of his left hand was his knockout against the former WBA heavyweight champion, Michael Dokes, in 1990. His favorite weapon in the ring turned out to be a versatile half-hook, half-uppercut left punch he called the Shredder, which represented most of his knockout victories. Even Mike had great respect for his powerful fist. With his The Crusher punch, he achieved 40 victories, 30 of which were by knockout. It could be none other than the Jamaican Donovan Ruddock, born on December 21st, 1963, in St. Catherine, Jamaica. Ruddock moved to Canada at an early age, where he discovered his love for boxing and began training at the local gym. His trainer quickly noticed Ruddock's potential and molded him into a genuine contender. As an amateur boxer, Ruddock defeated Lennox Lewis in March 1980 in Toronto in the Ontario Junior Boxing Championship, winning by a split decision, 3-2, in the 75 kilograms weight category. He turned professional in 1982, making his heavyweight debut and winning his first fight by technical knockout in the fourth round against West Rowe at the Columbus Event Center, Toronto, Canada. His aggressive style and powerful punch quickly gained recognition within the boxing community. By 1985, Ruddock had already obtained nine wins and a draw. However, that same year, he faced David Jocko on April 30th at the Sportsplex, Dartmouth, Canada. After eight rounds, Ruddock's corner threw in the towel when he complained of breathing problems. Jocko won by technical knockout. It was discovered that Ruddock had a rare respiratory condition, and doctors told him his career would end. After taking a 10-month break for rehabilitation, Ruddock made a full recovery to the surprise of doctors and resumed his boxing career, winning nine consecutive fights, eight of them by knockout, and achieving an impressive decision victory over former WBA heavyweight title holder, Mike Weaver. We are at the end. It goes the distance. The Jamaican also won the Canadian heavyweight title on May 28, 1988, against Canadian Ken Lacusta at Sass Tell Center, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Three straight left hooks, never followed with the right hand. There's a right hand, Lacusta is in In 1989, after two more KO victories, he had a bout with another former WBA heavyweight champion, the formidable James Bonecrusher Smith. In the second round, Smith knocked Ruddock down hard. But the Jamaican showed his heart by getting back up. In the seventh round, Ruddock impressively knocked out Smith. He's in trouble, Tim. Two more right hands and a left uppercut. Smith goes down. In November 1989, a fight was scheduled in Edmonton, Alberta for the title against the undisputed heavyweight champion, Mike Tyson. However, Tyson, claiming to be ill, canceled and opted to fight James Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Tyson lost that fight, marking one of the biggest upsets in boxing history, ending his streak of 37 consecutive victories. 
shot that will finish things in oh, the uppercut. What an uppercut by Douglas. Hey. After Tyson's defeat against James Douglas, he returned to the ring eager to reclaim the title. Ruddock, who had won three more fights after defeating James Smith, all by knockout, needed a bout with a top 10 fighter in the world rankings, and that boxer was Iron Mike. On March 18, 1991, at the Mirage in Paradise, Nevada, both boxers came out to demonstrate their superiority in the ring. Tyson started by throwing strong and precise punches, trying to assert his physicality and power over Ruddock. However, Ruddock didn't back down and responded with a series of jabs and uppercuts that managed to land on Tyson several times. In the first round, Ruddock connected a powerful left hook that staggered Tyson and pushed him back towards the ropes. Douglas throwing an uppercut from outside, he's throwing from way. At that moment, Ruddock attempted to finish Tyson with a series of punches, but Iron Mike managed to recover and began counterattacking, stopping Ruddock's advance. In the third round, Tyson landed a series of powerful punches that left Ruddock in bad shape and on the canvas. However, the Canadian managed to withstand the attacks and survive until the end of the round. By the seventh round, the fight reached its climax. Tyson started with a series of jabs that cornered Ruddock. He then delivered a right uppercut that connected squarely with Ruddock's chin, leaving him against the ropes. The referee decided to stop the fight while Donovan was on his feet, causing much controversy over the premature stoppage. This led to a brawl between the two teams in the ring, resulting in an immediate rematch being scheduled. The rematch between these beasts took place on June 28, 1991, at the same casino in Las Vegas. The first round began with Tyson showcasing his power from the start. With his characteristic aggressive style, he launched a series of devastating blows that made Ruddock retreat. However, the challenger didn't back down and responded with some solid punches that surprised Tyson. There's a left uppercut to the midsection by Razor. Razor's got to put some hard stinging punches in there or else he's going to get eaten up by Tyson. Looks like he's in the second round, Tyson continued to pressure Ruddock with his relentless attack. With his speed and precision, he managed to land several powerful blows that staggered the challenger. Nevertheless, Ruddock demonstrated his resilience and managed to stay on his feet, countering with some punches of his own. The third round proved to be a turning point in the fight. Determined to finish the match quickly, Tyson intensified his attack and unleashed a series of devastating blows that left Ruddock in trouble. The challenger wobbled and seemed on the verge of a knockout, but he managed to stay on his feet and respond with some punches of his own. It is round three. In the following rounds, the fight became more tactical. Tyson, aware of Ruddock's resilience, began using his hooks, while Ruddock looked for opportunities to counterattack and landed some powerful punches that kept Tyson alert. Tremendous punches, he comes back. And Ruddock another good two shots. Unbelievable shit. As the rounds progressed, the fight became more intense. Both boxers were determined to win and threw powerful punches in every exchange. Tyson, with his strength and aggressiveness, managed to connect some devastating blows that made Ruddock retreat. The last rounds were a true test of endurance and determination for both boxers. Tyson, Tyson is a fighting machine. Oh, Tyson just got hammered and he comes back fighting. Despite fatigue, they continued to throw powerful punches in the ring. Finally, after 12 rounds filled with action and excitement, the fight came to an end. The judges made their decision and declared Mike Tyson the winner by unanimous decision. It was a well-deserved victory for Tyson, who showcased his skill and aggressiveness in the ring. At the same time, it was evident that Donovan's powerful fist, 
the Shredder, had caused significant damage throughout the fight, although it didn't result in a knockout against Tyson. Mike Tyson is known for being a beast inside the ring, harboring enough strength in his fists to destroy any opponent who crossed his path. However, on some occasions, it hasn't been necessary for the level of sadism of the great Iron Mike to reach its peak to declare himself the winner of a bout. Some, with just a small taste of his strength, decide to retire from the ring. Welcome, in today's video, we'll tell you the controversial story behind the fight between Mike Tyson and Andrew Galota. Beyond narrating the fight, you'll know how time proved right the giant who left the ring that night diminished to dust. In his beginnings, nobody placed their faith in the youngest heavyweight champion in history to go beyond his moment of glory. However, the power of his fists was enough to keep him relevant throughout the following decades. With a tumultuous personal life, Tyson entered the new millennium adding to his streak of victories after defeating Julio Francisco and Lou Savarese, both by technical knockout in the second and first round, respectively. These victories led him to face a warrior who maintained the promise of destroying him in the fighting ring, a boldness that many had boasted of but few had achieved. Andrew Galota also had a good start to the new millennium, winning against Marcos Roche by technical knockout in the third round and against Orlin Norris by unanimous decision at the end of the tenth. The task wouldn't be easy, but everyone was eager to see what this warrior could do once he stepped into the ring to face a living legend, the Great Iron Mike. The agreed-upon date was October 20, 2000, the day Tyson and Galota were supposed to step into the ring at the Palace of Auburn Hills in Michigan to face their destiny living one of the most controversial battles in both their careers. Andrew Galota entered the ring resembling Robocop and everyone expected precisely from him to be an unstoppable machine that would give Tyson a tough battle for victory. Tyson entered dressed in white, as was customary. The crowd went wild just hearing his name, although he looked calm despite the opponent waiting for him in the ring. Galota's professional record was 36 wins, 29 of them by knockout and 4 losses. At just 32 years old, everyone thought he would be synonymous with vitality and endurance once the fight began. Tyson's record was nothing short of astonishing. At 34 years old, he already had 48 victories, 42 of them by knockout, 1 draw, and only 3 previous defeats. With the sound of the bell, the fight began. Tyson came out attacking Galota from the start, dodging severe body and head hooks that made the giant step back after the impact. Galota actively tried to counterattack Mike's offense, but it seemed that the difference in height worked against him as several of his attacks passed over Tyson's head. The height disparity was not a problem for Tyson. Throughout his career, he had turned what others saw as a weakness, especially in his early days, into a strength. By the last minute of the first round, Tyson's attack power reached a point of no return for Galota. With less than 15 seconds left, he received a right hook directly to his cheek that made him lose strength in his legs, ultimately falling to the canvas. Galota immediately got up, but he received the mandatory count to eight. Fortunately for him, when the fight resumed, the closing bell gave him the opportunity to take a deep breath and gather the pieces that had crumbled from his strategy to improve it for the next round. The second round started with a very evident headbutt from Tyson to Galota, which seemed to have intimidated the giant enough to neutralize his fighting spirit. Tyson's offensive sadism level attempted to be matched by Galota's counterattack, who occasionally landed good punches on his opponent but not strong enough to equal the level of damage he had suffered so early in the fight. Ironically, the second round ended with another headbutt from Tyson to Galota where the referee was heard saying it was an accident while putting distance between them and signaling them to continue the fight. Again, it seemed like the bell had saved Galota, but it wasn't perceived that way from his perspective. Suddenly, everyone began to see Galota pushing the members of his corner and showing resentment towards the referee's request to return to the fight. They tried to force his mouth guard back in, but there was no force in this world that would make him resume the fight. In this way, and with a look of confusion and anger, Tyson was declared the winner by technical knockout at the end of the second round. 
No one in the venue could believe what was happening. Despite being behind Tyson on the judges' scorecards, no one expected him to be the one to declare himself the loser by quitting the fight. The fact that he took the audacity to say, I quit, to his corner made him the target of hatred and resentment from all the people who had paid to see a spectacle only to go home witnessing more of a circus than a fight. The audience's repudiation escalated to such levels that Galota needed to be urgently taken to his dressing room, but on the way, he couldn't escape the reproach of the thousands of people in the venue who threw garbage and drinks at him left and right. Nobody seemed to understand why a fighter like him would so easily resign from a fight. Even his corner doubted if there was a real reason to believe himself incapable of continuing the fight. Despite the unfortunate moment he experienced after making his decision, time would prove him right. It would later be known that Galota had a broken bone in his head, which had the potential to pierce his brain if he continued the fight, and Tyson successfully executed some of the sadistic punches he is famous for, even to this day. The question many were asking then was how that bone got broken, since, given the shortness of the fight, it didn't seem like the fighters had reached such a violent fighting pace to suffer such consequences. But in the locker room, Galota made a statement that would try to make sense of this outcome. According to his testimony, Tyson kept headbutting him during the short period of time the fight lasted, and he pointed out the referee's inefficiency in not even giving him a warning for it. Again, time would put things in their place, and now it would be the great Iron Mike who would suffer the consequences of a tragic plot twist for his reputation. Initially, Tyson had been declared the winner by technical knockout, however, after the fight, he tested positive for marijuana. The beast had stepped into the ring under the influence of weed. And it was something that no sports entity could allow, not even to their greatest exponent. That's why a clear message was sought to be sent with the sanction that would ultimately be imposed on Mike, which said, if you play against the rules, you will be severely punished. The commission ended up changing the result from technical knockout to no contest due to Tyson's regrettable decision, making the outcome of the fight even more tragic. Why would Galota's career be buried if time proved him right, you might be wondering. The effect this controversial fight had on him was not only based on his reputation but also on his psychological health. Andrew Galota had to take a long three-year break from the fighting rings before being ready to face a new challenge again. Fortunately, his return to the ring was a success by defeating Brian Nix by technical knockout in the seventh round, although from then on, success was not precisely a constant in his career trajectory. Boxers like Mike Tyson have served as a model for should aspire to, a career defined by the power of their fists, and not by their ability to talk when making comments they can't back up in the ring. Brian Nielsen's career was almost flawless until he stepped into the ring against an Iron Mike who, at the age of 40, still had a lot to offer in the world of boxing. In today's video, we bring you the downfall of one of the biggest figures in Danish boxing, facing off against the American legend that very few could overcome. Brian Nielsen won the bronze medal at the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona before starting his professional career in September of the same year at the age of 27. As he progressed in his professional career, Brian managed to defeat greats like Ross Purity, James Smith, Tony Tubbs, Tim Witherspoon, and even the legendary Larry Holmes, where it's important to note that Holmes was already 47 years old at the time of the fight. Nielsen managed to equal Rocky Marciano's record, reaching 49 victories without a defeat. But he was not satisfied and intended to surpass the record of this great champion. However, these plans were thwarted when Dickie Ryan defeated him in June 1999 during the 10th round. Brian was not content with tasting defeat, so he prepared even more to beat him in a rematch. It seemed like he was once again heading to the top until he entered the ring with the great Iron Mike in October 2001. Before the fight, Tyson reached the peak weight of his career at 239 pounds. He knew he had to build an even bigger strength if he wanted a chance against the now overweight opponent. Nielsen was welcomed that night in the arena as a champion, but his fans were overshadowed when Tyson entered the scene. Mike hadn't been in the ring for a year, but he was determined to prove that his strength had not rusted at all. Nielsen entered the ring with confidence, a year younger than Tyson, and with a respectable record of 62 victories, 43 of them by knockout, having been defeated only once by Dickie Ryan. He felt the embrace of the Danish crowd, 
but it wasn't the first time that Iron Mike had to fight on enemy territory. At the time, Tyson's record stood at 48 victories, with 42 by knockout, only 3 defeats, and 2 draws. This time, it seemed that the statistics did not favor the great Iron Mike. However, as a boxer known for surprising us in the ring, the final word was not yet spoken. When the opening bell rang, Tyson wasted no time in coming out of his corner with the aggression that characterized him. In less than 10 seconds of the first round, he had Nielsen against the ropes. Oh, quick combination of the head, and down goes Nielsen! The giant Brian Nielsen nearly left the ring if it weren't for the ropes catching him. And, by the look on his face, it seemed like he was the most surprised by how low he had fallen early in the match. The referee counted, but Nielsen wasn't going to allow Tyson to get away with it that easily in his territory. He got up and seemed to show signs that everything was in order to continue the fight, although his strength had already been damaged. He only had to stand firm for 16 more seconds to survive this third round. But, with fighting his enormous body against a corner, demonstrating the physical toll of someone who had run a marathon, it seemed like the end for this Danish warrior. The great Iron Mike had shattered him in just three rounds, leaving him on his knees, clinging to the ropes like someone begging for mercy from his executioner. His team and the referee assisted him while everyone asked the same question, can he continue? Out of pure pride or his arrogant nature, he took the five minutes granted to him to recover and came out to try to counter the fateful third round he had recently endured. Nielsen tried to minimize Tyson's attacks as much as possible by leaning into his body, buying some time, hoping the referee would create some distance between them. During this fourth round, Tyson unleashed the perfect combinations of punches to earn a couple of points on the judges' scorecards. From the effects of that knockdown, his five clear eyes and his legs seem to be under him, but that low blow seemed... Yeah, but right now he's doing it on Nielsen. Unfortunately for the By the day, bringing you great emotions and tales with happy endings from a sport that can bring out the best and worst in its participants. Mike Tyson has accumulated a lot of casualties in his professional boxing career against fighters who almost doubled his size. He has never felt fear or been intimidated by the words of those boxers who know how to attack in press conferences but fail to live up to their threats once they enter the honorable fighting ring. What happened on the day these two profiles clashed? Welcome, in today's video I will talk to you about the fight where Iron Mike had to face the most conceited fat man of his entire career and he lived to tell the tale. Once again demonstrating that punches have the final say in the noble art of boxing, this is the encounter between Mike Tyson and Brian Nielsen that everyone was talking about in 2001. I hope you're comfortable because this battle is about to begin. Born on April 1st, 65, Brian Nielsen is a well-remembered Danish professional boxer today. Probably his greatest moments of glory were experienced before stepping into the ring to face Iron Mike. From 96 to 99, he held the IBO heavyweight title. Nielsen successfully defended his title five times, even against the legendary Larry Holmes and the almost unstoppable Phil Jackson. Establishing the second highest number of defenses second only to Vladimir Klitschko, he was not necessarily a rival you wanted to step into the ring with. At one point, he matched Rocky Marciano's record of 49 consecutive wins without defeats. With Tyson nearing the end of the second decade of his professional career, opinions on what would happen once he entered the ring to face Nielsen were more than divided. Under this uncertainty, both fighters entered the Park Hen Ring in Copenhagen, Denmark, on October 13, 2001. Steve Smogger was the man tasked with ensuring a fair fight, while the critical eye of Erky Marinen, Daniel Van de Weel, and Marty Denkin were to declare a winner at the end of the scheduled 10 rounds if the force of their fists was not enough to claim victory. With 62 victories, 43 of them by pains, 48 victories, 42 of them by knockout were not exactly anything. But coupled with his three previous losses and two draws, it seemed the balance tipped in favor of the conceded Dane. With the bell sound, the first round of the contest began. 
Tyson honored his legacy from the get-go, cornering Nielsen and executing a powerful combination of body punches to waste no time in working towards his victory. I'm not sure yet. The body and the head now. It seemed the Danish fat man had run out of ammunition early in the fight when he focused on his guard to avoid being injured by the missiles raining from all directions. Your day. Select the next one and I'll see you there.